Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> if at any time you want to affirm that you hear me and you are part of this hunger that I'm describing, just feel free to say amen or hallelujah or any of those things. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa Landrum. I'm the director of women's ministry here. And for those of you who are here for the first time or you missed a couple weeks, we are in the Hungry series. And in this series, we're learning about how to transform those hungers we have for things that are not of God to things that are of God. So, for example, we're learning how the Bible and the words in the Bible can nourish our souls as food nourishes our body. We're learning how solitude and just getting away from the noise of this world can give us peace with God. And each week, we have somebody come up and share their hunger. And this week, it's me. And as I thought about my hunger, I thought, gosh, how do I put this into words? This is like my lifelong ache, uh, something that I've been, that always comes to haunt me. So uh, I thought, how do I tell you about an intangible, about a craving, about a feeling? about a hunger to fit in and a hunger to belong. When I was a little kid, I saw a Christmas cartoon. And this cartoon just described how I feel way too often. There is an island, and Rudolph was coming to save us. And I was one of the misfit toys on the island. Amen. <laughs> it's always good to get that first one in there. Uh, I, I, my family did not understand. They identified with Rudolph, the hero. Uh, they wanted to be Santa. I have an uncle who, to this day who's like, I'm Santa. I'm so giving. But I felt comfortable identifying with those misfit toys. And that's a struggle that I've always kept, even as I've grown. So what did that look like when I was younger? Um, I'm only telling you because I came to Christ late, so I have a lot of time before I was a Christian to talk about. <laughs> so over the years, I tried to fill it with everything. I did that self-medicating thing in my college years. That didn't really work out so well for me. But does anybody remember their 21st birthday, and was it a blur like mine? Um, I know I had one. I have some photos. They show me in a cake. They show the person who was supposed to be jumping out of the cake to wish me happy birthday. So I know that celebration happened, but I, I don't remember it. <laughs> Let's just say I am glad that that phase went away. Then I started working, and there was that phase to keep up with the Jones. Anybody got that one? Uh, that one takes you to really strange places. I worked with designers, so they shopped, so I shopped. Uh, these shoes. One of my favorite testaments of not letting the opinion of someone else lead you down a path. Be strong. I knew I was in trouble when the woman said, oh my gosh, those are great. Reese Witherspoon bought those two days ago. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but Reese Witherspoon and I definitely do not walk in the same financial circles. <laughs> so this was two weeks of work for Reese's casual, probably throwaway shoes. <laughs> um, when it came time to buy a car, SUVs were popular, so I had to get an SUV. There was only two of us, but that didn't matter. That was the car everybody else had. That was the car I needed. My child needed a PlayStation. When they first came out, first generation, he was three, didn't know what a PlayStation was. He didn't need the PlayStation. I needed him to have the PlayStation so I could talk to the people at my job about my child and his PlayStation while they were talking about their child and their PlayStation. Frogger. That was an amazing game, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and if I just stopped here and said, I became a Christian and all of that changed, I wouldn't be really being honest and transparent. Because even as a Christian, 
even knowing all the scripture I know and all the people I know, that hunger still creeps up every now and then where I feel like I don't belong. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 2, 19 says, you're no longer uh, foreigners and strangers or aliens, but fellow citizens with God and his family. And yet I still sometimes feel like that alien. So we've been going through this series and people have been telling you different ways that they're transforming. We've heard about fasting. We've heard about solitude. Here's some things that I do to transform when that thing happens that I don't want to think about. The thing that happens to Christians where I become the wearer of the mask, the fake mask of security, where I'm good, everything's fine. Inside I'm a bowl of jelly and I'm quivering, but on the outside, it's all good. When that happens, when I feel that coming on, the first thing I do is get back into my scriptures. Because inevitably, when I start doing quiet time to check it off the list, that's when it catches up to me. And that's when that fear starts to become strong again. I use my car as my car ministry for worship. It's just me and God in there. I can sing as loud as I want. I can mess up words. I can challenge the person singing because he knows my heart. And he knows that I'm singing to him. And then lastly, I get in community. I get in my Bible study groups. I get with other women. And I drop the mask. I get real. I let them sharpen me. I let them be my lean into people. So I can remind myself that I'm not alone. And I'm not the only one hungry. Now we're going to bring the ushers down, and for those of us who call this place home, we're going to give back to God what he so freely gives back to us. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We are in a series called Hungry because we're asking the question, do we hunger for God like we hunger for stuff, like we hunger for food, like we hunger for things, possessions, relationships? Do we really hunger for God? And we've been introducing some disciplines in this series, and we've looked at fasting, and so far nobody's died because they fasted on Monday. That's, we just haven't had anyone report that they didn't make it through the day. And so we've been encouraging our church family, take part of Monday, maybe breakfast, maybe lunch, maybe the whole three meals, whatever. But when the series is over, we hope that that discipline will continue because it's not that we're just not eating, but we're feasting on the beauty of Christ and his word during those times where we're humbling ourselves and refraining from something that our body is craving. You see, the reality is we live in a culture that is with full stomachs but empty souls. And we want to address that in this series. We also looked at solitude last week, breaking away from the noise of culture. Sometimes that's just simply turning off our phone. Maybe it's taking a walk, just separating, breaking a little bit from the mundane of the noisiness of each of our days and getting before God and being alone with him. Today we want to look at an undervalued and underpracticed discipline that is so powerful and so important, and that is scripture study. If you want to feed your soul, we need scripture to fill us. And we're going to look at that this morning. I love the imagery that Peter gives to us in his epistle 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation if you have tasted of the kindness of the Lord. I love how Peter says that. Now, we've had children. We now have grandchildren. And there's something about a newborn baby that just loves milk. And, and Peter says, we should love God's word like a baby loves milk. I mean, do you compare yourself? Do you cry out for God's word? You know, a baby will never stop crying until they get the milk, right? And sometimes we're just so satisfied without the word of God. I don't know how we do that. That's what we're addressing this morning. So we're going to go to a text that I think says a lot more than I've even got time to share, but find your way to James chapter 1, please, this morning. James chapter 1. What a privilege to open God's word, to teach it, and to share in this time these short minutes together. 
Right there in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 18 down through 25, just see if you can follow some of the beautiful nuances of the Word of God and what the Word of God does in our lives. So pick it up in verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the Word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Stop right there. Okay. This is a powerful passage, and honestly, I can't even answer or address all the stuff that's in here, but I want to show you in these minutes that we have three really important things. First, I want to show you a simple premise And then I want to show you a top priority. And then finally, we're going to end with an amazing promise, okay? So all of that's found in this little passage that we've just looked at. Let's look at this simple premise. The simple premise of what James is saying here is that what gives life sustains life. What gives life sustains life. Say that with me. What gives life sustains life. Notice it says that we were, we, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. Verse 18. We have been born again by the word of truth. Remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and the devil tempted him and the devil said, if you're the son of God, make these stones to be bread. And Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Life and life flourishing comes from the word of God. We get our spiritual life from the word of God. And we know that Jesus, who's the one that is our life, is the living word, right? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, verse 14, and the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that Jesus is the living word and that we have this word called the Bible. So the written word and the living word is that which brings us into spiritual life. Let me introduce you to somebody that recently came to spiritual life. This is Lester and Lee. Now, Lester's the guy next to me. Just a couple of weeks ago, Lee, his friend, had a real burden for Lester because Lester was diagnosed with a really serious cancer situation. And, uh, and so Lee, his friend, was not sure that Lester had a relationship with God. So he began talking to him. And Lee called me and said, my friend, he's going to have this major surgery. He might not even make it through the surgery. He's got a religious background, but I'm not sure if he's saved I would love to have you just talk with him. I don't want to mess this up. Could we do it? I said, yes. So we get together and we just have a little time. And in a few short minutes of sharing the simple message of the gospel that we are saved by faith through, uh, saved by faith through grace, not as a matter of, I'm sorry, saved by grace through faith, not as a matter of our own works, but it is a gift of God. Just sharing simple things, simple truth from the word of God, Lester quietly bowed his head and opened his heart to Jesus and asked Jesus to come into his life. Now watch this. Lester was a religious guy. He had raised in a Presbyterian church. He went to Sunday school as a kid. But all his adult life, God was just sort of over there on the shelf with the Bible that he had in his his house. But he never had a personal relationship with God. And that day, five minutes before that picture was taken, Lester stepped into what life is really about. He came to life through the word of truth. This is what God does in our hearts. And he's a new guy. Now listen, I, I thought, started thinking about this when thinking about this message today, and I was thinking about the fact that I eat food every day, unless I'm fasting, but I eat food every day. And so one day I decided, I'm going to time, how much time do I spend eating food? So I marked through the day. I eat about 10 minutes for breakfast, 20 minutes for lunch, about 30 minutes for dinner, and then if you throw a few snacks in there, I just kind of kept track all day long. And about a little over an hour every day, I spend, you know, eating food. And that's kind of my pattern. Now, maybe you take a little longer to eat or maybe a little shorter, but you should just someday, a little experiment, time how much of time you give every day to eating and nourishing your physical body. Now, ask yourself the question, do I give as much time to nourishing, nourishing my spiritual body? Do I actually? No, so think about this. Like if, if you timed your eating physically and you came out with like, like two and a half minutes a day, how, much, how long do you think you would live? <laughs> 
I mean, really, you would become, you would slowly be malnourished. If you ate two minutes a day, you say, well, you don't know how fast I can eat. I can eat a lot in two minutes. <laughs> don't mess up my point. The point is, <laughs> if you only eat a couple of minutes a day, you're going to be malnourished in no time at all. And yet some of us are thinking of our spiritual lives, and we get little sound bites. We get a little thing here, a little there. Start the, maybe we open the Bible in the morning for a verse or two of Scripture. And I'm not putting that down. The point is, but the reality is, we're not nourishing our spiritual bodies like we nourish our physical bodies. And that's what gives life, sustains life. All right, that's the simple premise. Are you blessed by that? I hope you are. All right, let's see. Here's the second thing. There's a top priority that we see here. This is verses 19 through 25. This is the big, the big section of the, ch- of the little section. And what we find here in this section is that every one of us, no matter how old or young, no matter how long we've known Jesus, no matter how long we've been around the church, whatever, we must give God's word its proper place in our lives. So here's the top priority. We need to give God's word its rightful place in our lives. Now, you may agree with that, but let's talk about what James says give it, gives it its rightful place. Number one, he says, if you're going to give God's word its rightful place, you've got to listen to it. You've got to listen to it. And notice verse 19, dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Um, a, a lot of times this is taken out of context, actually, and we treat it only in a relational sense. Like, how many of us here know people that just talk too much? Anybody? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, don't poke the person next to you. Just... <laughs> we all know people that talk too much. And if you've ever had a relationship where someone does more talking than listening, it's not a real fair exchange. It's just not that much fun to be around them. In fact, we tend to avoid people that when they trap us and just only want to talk and never want to listen, it gets a little wearing on us, right? Now, if you can't think of anybody like that in your life, I have news for you. You might be that person. You just <laughs> might be the one I'm talking about here. Now think about our relationship with God. A lot of us are you're great talkers, but we're not good listeners. So we talk to God. We're always telling him our problems, stuff we wish to fix in our life. But when do we listen to him? When do we stop? And I think sometimes God's like, when I'm thinking about people that kind of wear me down with their, their talking, I think sometimes that's maybe the way God sees me. Like I'm just kind of going off talking all the time and I never stop and listen for what he wants to say. I got to listen to what God wants to tell me. Some of us are better talkers than listeners. And notice James says that listening requires two things. First of all, well, it requires one thing. It requires getting rid of some stuff that's not good in our life. Look at verse uh, 21. It says, um, so, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you. So if you want to hear God's voice, you got to get rid of junk in your life. And some of us have sin that we're not repenting of, we're not confessing before God, we're living in a comfortable place, we just say, it doesn't matter, God doesn't care. And I just, I want to exhort the body of Christ today, if we've got sin, stuff that we know God doesn't want in our life, we got to confess and repent and move away from that stuff. Because if we don't, we're not going to hear the voice of God, that's what James is telling us. And if you can't remember the last time you heard God's voice, I don't mean audibly, but like, oh, that really came from God. If you're not getting that on a regular basis, can I suggest to you that maybe there's stuff cluttering the voice, that you're not hearing God because there's too much self or ego or pride or sin or whatever else that might be in our lives. Listening, watch this, listening opens the door for God's word to do its work. Listening opens the door for God's word to do its work. God's word is powerful. And if we just let it do its work, it's amazing. So I want to introduce another friend. This is Ross. I met Ross playing basketball at 24-Hour Fitness one day. And, um, and just in a short time, you know, after the game, I was, we were just talking. And I didn't know that he knew me. He recognized me because a few years ago when he was in college, he went to our church. And so we're just shooting the breeze and talking a little bit and asking him. He just graduated. He had been out of college for a couple of years. He said, my life is just kind of floundering along. He's, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. And so I just felt led. I said to him, hey, you know, this might sound really weird, a little invasive, but I pray for people and I want to pray for you this week. I'm going to pray every day for you, Ross. And he's like, whoa, thank you. So the next Sunday, I'm sitting in church. I look over and there's Ross. I never even invited him to church. I'm thinking, whoa, this is awesome. So I go over there, and then I find out the story. He knew who I was, and he said to me later, he said, the day you said you would pray for me, he said, that sort of welled up in me the reality that I've just kind of drifted from stuff. And he goes, and so we're on the lobby on that Sunday talking, and he goes, where do I go from here? Like, I, I have accepted Christ. I just don't know what to do. I said, you, you need the word of God. So 
I said, why don't you read the Gospel of John this week? Gave him a little Gospel of John. And he goes, okay, I will. So we met the next week. We went through the Gospel of John. He had all these questions and stuff. He goes, what do I do now? I go, well, how about read the book of Romans? So he got in the book of Romans. We met again. We talked about the whole New Testament. We just like, and suddenly he's tasting and seeing that the Lord is good and he's loving God's word. Pretty soon I put a Bible in his hand and he's reading, reading, reading. Now he's living over in San Francisco and he's trying to find a place over there like this place because he works on Sundays at a golf course, but he wants to get to church in the morning. But all of this hunger started in his life when he started getting into the book. And I think some of us have downplayed the word of God to our life. Listen, we're not listening and we're not letting it do its work. If you'll let it do its work, you'd be amazed what God will do. I love these verses. Isaiah 55, 10 says, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without water in the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed in the, and so, excuse me, sorry, for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That's God's promise about his word. You get your face in his book and you're gonna see some things start happening in your life that you would have not seen had you not. I love this verse, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing between joints and marrow, dividing soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word is so powerful. So to give God's word its rightful place in our lives, we gotta listen to it. The second thing that James tells us here in James 1 is that not only do we need to listen to it, but we need to what? Obey it. Otherwise, we're like someone that just looks in the mirror, goes away, he says in verses 22 and 23, we just forget who we are, we, we just don't know. But verse 25, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it. See, we need to listen to God's word, but we need to do God's word too. We need to obey it. And that's something that some of us today need to kind of focus on a little bit. And by the way, a lot of us, uh, you know, we get little sound bites. We're good at sound bites. We're not really focused and thinking on what the content of Scripture is. So can I give you a couple things that will help you when it comes to Scripture and obedience? If you're taking notes, number one, obeying God, God's Word will require an intentional pursuit. You've got to get into the book intentionally. You'll never accidentally read God's Word. <laughs> I mean, unless you see it like on a bumper sticker or something like that. I mean, every day we have to intentionally put ourselves there. Notice that James says, verse 25, who looks intently into the perfect law. This, this little phrase, looked in, intently, it's from the Greek uh, word parakipto, which means to stoop over. It means to examine with a, with a, with a sense of, of urgency. It's the same word used of the Apostle John when he and Peter ran to the tomb of Jesus. Remember they heard that the body wasn't there? So they're running real fast and they get there and it says that John, when he got there, Peter ran right in, but John stooped in and looked. He was like, he was observing. He was carefully assessing what's going on. This is the word that is used here that James describes the way we come to the word of God. We have to look at it. We have to examine it. We have to stoop over it. We need to hunger it for transformation, not just information. We're asking ourselves the question, am I doing this right? Am I living for Christ the way Christ wants me to? And, and frankly, you know, we, we're, not, we're not really people of the book. We should, be, we should have Bibles that are marked up and worn out. And a lot of us, we don't even carry our Bibles anymore. We don't bring them to church. We can't count on the screens to show us Scripture and you know, we're just, unfortunately, we're all kind of just going down this slide of not really seeing the word what it needs to be. Uh, I had a privilege this past week to take a couple of guys that I love dearly. We've done this about six years in a row, a little backpacking trip up in the high Sierras, immigrant uh, wilderness. And so for three days, actually about 50 six hours or so, we were together from Thursday morning at 5 a.m. till last evening at about 5 p.m. And we were in this place. And the, the thing I love about this trip and these guys is that these guys love the book. And the guy on my right, that's Mike and, and Dan over on my left. And these guys, they had their Bibles with them every day. It doesn't matter what we were doing. If we were down by the lake fishing, if we were out hiking, we'd carry our Bibles all the time. It was like having a, you know, like a sidearm or something. And we just like always sitting down and just going through scripture and asking questions. And it was cracking me up yesterday morning because as we were having breakfast, Mike, who's been trying to read through the book of Numbers, he said, I want to finish the book of Numbers uh, while we're on this trip. And he was about halfway through it or something. But 
you know, this is 6.30 in the morning. We're boiling our, our, our oatmeal. It's kind of cold outside. And Mike's still in his sleeping bag right there on the dirt, right next to us where we're, you know, having this stuff. And he's reading the book of Numbers. And it was just so cool. I kept, you know, I kept hearing as he's in this little thing, he's like, whoa, you know, whoa, what's this? You know, and he's asking these questions. And it was just so delightful for me to be around a couple of guys that just love the Word of God and to have literally like about a 50-hour, except for the couple hours that we slept every night, 50 or so hours of just a conversation about God and His Word. I, I think there needs to be like this, you know, there needs to be the rhythm of my daily time in the Word, but there needs to be this piece where I'm fleshing it out and talking about it with my friends and having conversations about it and asking questions about it. I love what the... the the Word of God tells us um, in terms of this picture that we should sit before the Word of God every day. There should be an intentional focus, and that's what James is saying. It also requires a consistent pattern of absorbing it, and that's really what I want to talk about in terms of, uh, uh, look at verse 25, and continues in it. This is not like an in and out, like a one-shot deal or like once a week. This is like a, a daily time that we spend with the Lord and His Word. Is that happening in our lives? You know, do we open God's word? We say, Lord, I need to hear from you today. I need this like I need food in my body. And I love the psalmist, he says in Psalm 1, he says, talking about the, psalm, the, the, the righteous man, the blessed man, he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he what? He meditates, how long? Day and night. And some of us, we're just, we're just kind of off the mark because this is not really our focus. We've our lives are busy, and this, this is the point of this series, is that every, we're getting pulled in every single direction, but we, we need to pull away at times, stop eating and getting nourished. We need to build a, a rhythm of fasting in our lives. I hope after this series is done, we're going to keep fasting one day a week. I hope we will. And I hope that during that time, it's not that we're just not eating, but that we're, we're nourishing our souls in the Word of God, and then we're breaking away at times by just shutting off our electronics and getting alone before God and saying, God, now I'm in the listening mode. Lord, what are you going to say to me as we open the scripture and we let God speak to us? Notice he says also that obeying God's word not only requires an intentional focus, a consistent pattern, but it also requires not forgetting what you've heard. You got to remember this stuff. And boy, every, this church is great for that because every week I sit in church, I listen to a Pastor Danny or someone preach, and I need that reminder. I go, man, that's so good. I need that in my life. And, and we need that daily. We need reminders every day. All right. Brings me to the last thing, and this is the part that I hope nobody misses. And that is there's an amazing promise here. There's a simple premise, a top priority. The top priority is listen and obey God's word. But here's this, this is the amazing promise. When you live your life that way, what, is, what does James say? He says, they will be what? Blessed in what they do. How many want a life of blessing? Anybody here? Anybody? All right, there's about five of us that want a life of blessing. <laughs> Everyone, oh, I should have raised my hand on that one. We all want to have a blessed life. And God is telling us right here in his word that when we put ourselves before the word of God and not just listen to it, but we obey it, it tells us right here, first of all, this word saves us. Not, look, at, look at back at verse 21, which can save you. That's not salvific. That's not salvation from death to life. That's salvation like saving us from doing stupid stuff, saving us from temptation, saving us from wrong choices, saving us from saying cruel words. The word of God saves us from all kinds of stuff. And we're blessed when we do it. We're blessed. I want a blessed life. And I recently, um, I took a trip. I had an opportunity to take my daughter to Norway. This is Katie, my oldest. Um, I'm Norwegian, if you didn't know that. This probably explains a lot about me right now. But anyway, so <laughs> um, I, I, we, we found out we've got family in Norway uh, still. And so we just had to go. So my daughter and I go, and we visit my distant family in a little town called Vistagrad. But watch this. Um, I learned about my lineage, about a couple things. And one of the things I learned way back, all the way back to my great, great, great grandfather, I learned that these were hardworking, simple, organized, just get there, get it done kind of people. And I thought, wow, that kind of resonates with me. I mean, now I kind of know my, my background. They were, they, were, they were just get it done, simple people. 
And the other thing I learned about my family lineage is that they were people that loved God and were people of the book. And that really blessed me. Here's a picture of my great-grandfather. This is Osbjorn. He's the one in the middle. <laughs> um, these, are, these are his two sisters on either side, okay? This is in 1890, okay? Now, don't they look like they're happy people, by the way? They're just happy... <laughs> Happy people. But here's the thing about Osbjorn. Osbjorn was a guy that loved God, and he loved the book. And Osbjorn married a woman named Berta right here on this little place, this little chapel. This is on the North Sea, Vistagrad, Norway. See the impression in the grass there? That's where the church used to be. That was built in 1600, and in the late 19, uh, 1950s or something, they, it, it went down and they, they built another church to replace it, but they put this little chapel up there in that place. So my family took me and da my, daughter, my, my daughter Katie to this place, and, and I stood right there in that little shoal of the grass thinking of my great-grandfather and his wife pledging together to be married and living their life for Christ. In 1883, Osbjorn and his wife, and having two children, Norway was really tough, hard to farm, they decided a big risk, and they moved their family to the United States. They landed in a little place called Platt, uh, South Dakota, and there they homesteaded. And there they raised five more children, one of which was a guy by the name of Sam, who was my grandfather. And Sam was also a man who ra was raised in his uh, Osbjorn's family to love God, to follow God. And, and all the siblings, not all the siblings followed God. But my grandfather, Sam, followed God. He was an itinerant preacher. He preached in little churches when preachers or pastors were away. He loved the book. He was a simple farmer. He was a guy that just got things done, and he loved the book. And then my dad. Sam had four children. My dad was one of his four children. And my dad also loved the book, loved Scripture, taught and raised his children, me and my two sisters, to love God and follow the Lord too. Let me show you something. This is, this is my grandfather's Bible. And I think it might have been my great-grandfather's Bible too because there's some inscriptions in here. I think my great-grandfather, Osbjorn, handed this to Sam who handed it to Arnold who handed it to me. And every time I look at it, I think there were prayers prayed. There was a life that was hard. There was a lot of tears and a lot of heartache. You know, I could tell you stories about my family and all the stuff that happened. And not everybody in the Vold lineage all the way back, not everybody are people of the book. But there's a strain that goes down. And now I'm stewarding the same thing that I'm trying to hand off to my family, to my kids, and to my great-grandkids, grandkids, and my great-grandkids that I don't even know and I've never even met. I was so moved at this little place that I said, I, and I, I met my third cousin, who is the great-grandson of my great-grandfather's sister, if you can figure that out. She was one of the people in the picture. <laughs> and when he opened the door of his house, the farm where my great-grandfather farmed, I knew I was family because, look, we're dressed alike, we look alike. <laughs> we had never met. We're just both, he opens the door, we both just start cracking up. And his name is Osbjorn, too. And I said, Osbjorn, I go, after about an hour talking, I go, Osbjorn, I got to do something. Would you go out with me to where the farm stood, right in his backyard where the old farm used to be? Would you be, go out there with me? And could we pray? I want to pray for my grandkids and my great-grandkids and my kids. And I want to pray for yours, too, because I have a feeling that Osbjorn and Abraham before us and Sam and all those guys, they prayed for the kids that were coming. They prayed for the kids they'll never meet. But they'd be people of the book. And I thought, Lord, am I just a recipient of a faithful praying man that said, God, I don't know, I'll ever meet. And he would have never known that I'd stand on a platform like this and preach to hundreds and maybe even thousands of people in my life because he prayed for his family, that they'd be people of the book. I want to be a man of the book. How about you? Let's go to the Lord. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for scripture. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for changing our lives and giving us life. And I pray, Lord, for anyone here today that does not have life, that they might, like Lester, 
simply open their hearts and trust in you. And for those of us who are malnourished today, and we know it, we haven't cracked your Bible in years. Well, maybe it's only been months or even weeks, but Lord, we know we need to be in your book. So Lord, help us to develop this discipline in our lives so that we can be blessed and represent you everywhere we go. Thank you, Jesus, our living word. And all God's people said, amen. amen.